call to order the Therapeutic Use of Cannabis Advisory Council. Welcome, everybody. Uh, first item on the agenda. There's some stuff over here if you want. Uh, I think there's, there's enough for everybody. Um, we have a motion on the minutes from October 24th. I'm sure you've all studied these great questions. I have one question. Sure. My name is spelled wrong on that one. Yeah. Okay, no problem. This, that's the correct spell. This is the correct spell. There was one typo to you got, I, I fixed your name from chef to chief. With those uh, amendments, we have a motion to approve. I'll move. Second. I'll move and second it. Any further discussion? Any questions? All those in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Uh, we have, uh, by statute, the requirement to make a report um, to all kinds of people. I think you've all had this report. Um, this is the right report. Um, sent you by email. Um, we need to go through this um, in as much uh, thoroughness. But obviously, it doesn't say a heck of a lot. I mean, it's a, it's a rather strange requirement, but that often happens in statutes that you're required by a certain date to. So we, we say wonderful things like the committee met and they formed the chairman and the chairman appointed a clerk. And, all of this goes to the, to the governor and the, to all kinds of people. Uh, so, uh, Mike, do you want to go through the, uh, I think this is going to be a quick meeting today, I, and I appreciate this time of year, people coming in, and so many people coming today. Um, but I have, my suspicion is this will be short, but in the past, sometimes that's been famous last words. So, <laughs> so let's take a look at this. Sure. So um, this uh, draft annual report, which is due to be sent out by us uh, by January 1st, I sent it out to the council about maybe two weeks ago, um, sent a reminder about a week ago. Um, I didn't receive any comments back, so I'm assuming that it's largely going to be okay. But as we, get, we can walk through the, uh, the component parts, um, there shouldn't be any surprises in here. Most of the information contained in the document is also contained in our minutes for the past two meetings. Uh, the report starts with uh, the names and affiliations of the, member, the, the council membership. It goes on to repeat or uh, reprint the charge of the council, our responsibilities from RSA 126X9. Uh, the next section is a listing of the council meeting dates, starting with our organizational meeting on September 26th, our October 24th meeting, and then today's meeting, where the annual report should be adopted. Uh, and then it goes into details about uh, s summaries of uh, what we did at each of the meetings. At our organizational meeting, we elected a chair. Uh, we had a presentation from Attorney Gene Herrick from the Department of Justice on legal and ethical considerations and requirements. Uh, I presented an overview of the Advisory Council's enabling legislation. Uh, the Commissioner of Health and Human Services, <coughs> Nicholas Tupas, gave an introduction and an overview of the department's plan for getting this program up and running, describing how it's going to be a collaborative approach within the department, um, pulling from various divisions and personnel. He presented a, uh, a draft business plan outline, um, which we've been trying to populate and develop as we've uh, uh, been researching um, and making the program stand up. Um, and finally, at our meeting, we had a um, 
uh, eight, we discussed pieces of legislation, technical fixes to RSA 126, which would um, allow the department to better implement the program. Um, and those two pieces of legislation were endorsed by this council. Um, they have subsequently found sponsors, and they have, um, they'll be part of the, uh, the legislative session this year. Uh, our next year. Um, at our October 24th meeting, um, we had an overview of the administrative rulemaking process. I provided a flowchart of all the different steps for uh, required for rulemaking. Um, and I also presented uh, the department's first guess at our proposed time frames for rulemaking. Um, next, we um, talked about, uh, presented, I presented an overview of uh, the therapeutic cannabis program within the department by describing a uh, process, a program diagram. Um, we had a legislative update. Um, yeah, and that was, and uh, we also had a, um, a public, uh, a member from the public speak to us as well, Eric Golter from New Hampshire Normal. Um, December 19th meeting is uh, it's pretty short because we haven't had it yet. <laughs> um, all it says is discussion on council's annual report. Um, what follows is the attachment list um, from uh, Gene Herrick's presentation, the commissioner's business plan outline, House Bill 573 milestones, the program diagram for the, from the department, endorsed legislation, rulemaking flowchart, and the HHS rulemaking timeframes. So it's all there. <coughs> any, any questions or comments? Or, um, okay. I, I move that we adopt this. Do we have a second? Second. Any discussion? Just a, a question. I sure. apologize we didn't get to you um, before the meeting, but um, in the uh, responsibilities that are outlined for this council, there are the items that refer to the council charge numbers here, one through eleven, and um, in and then there's a time frame listed of um, either pre or post-implementation or both, pre and post-implementation. The question I had is for, for three of these, the uh, number one, six, and eight, if um, there couldn't be some, they, they have to do with measurement of success, basically satisfaction or, or success of the, of the program itself, based on the research that's done based on best practice in other states, et cetera. Could there be some measurements established before the program has begun? So those things, have, they, what are the benchmarks we're going to use to determine the success of the program? So for instance, the satisfaction piece. Um, if, if you look back, well, you'll see Dr. Glassman is smiling because that, those are exactly the issues that he raised at the last meeting. Oh, OK. And I wasn't here. I'm sorry. Sure. Yeah, that, don't be sorry, because that's a validation of uh, the importance of that. Um, we're, we're, we're looking at the National Conference of State Legislators to see uh, if they have somebody on their staff. But, uh, it, it's actually a fairly complicated issue when you start to look into uh, the question of how do you measure um, the effectiveness of this program, meaning the effectiveness of marijuana in, in treatment. Uh, so we're beginning to pursue that because we felt that was something we can do uh, um, as we're going along. And, and part of it is we advise the department as they proceed. <coughs> part of what they're proceeding with is administrative rules that goes through a whole series of um, steps be before they come to us to be reviewed. So the, I've been looking for things that we can do in the meantime there also was a, a um, story in the Concord Monitor just recently about um, um, the amount of um, tainted material that might be um, on marijuana uh, that people use. And I thought also that we should then get a toxicologist maybe to come in and talk to us about uh, that issue because that, that's a very different one from, from uh, 
um, uh, the uh, metrics to use uh, in terms of measurement. Uh, so um, we were working on that. Um, part of our struggle um, is those of you uh, that work in the Department of Health and Human Services probably know that the agency, the organization is pretty depleted. I think from the time that Commissioner Tumpus came to now, there's probably 800 less employees in that department, which is massive. Uh, so that to expect Mike to do a, a lot of things, uh, like get in touch with NCSL, I've decided I better take that on myself. Uh, uh, because he does all the <coughs> administrative rules. In fact, we had an administrative rules meeting this morning. Uh, so that an awful lot of people in the department are doing two jobs simultaneously. Uh, so it's going to be incumbent on us as individuals to pursue uh, some of these kinds of information that are really important, but, which is a different kind of burden than we usually have. Uh, so where are we here? But, but, um, we, we haven't passed this yet. And so we have that question. Any other questions? Well, I think the thing to also understand about outcomes is positive and negative. What are the positive things we're looking for? What are some of the negative outcomes that might occur? Right. So we want to look at both sides of that question. Any other comments? Okay. Are you ready? We need to accept this report to send it. So we've had a motion to uh, um, approve the report. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. The next item up on the agenda is an up a HHS update on what we've been doing, our progress over the past couple months. Um, I put together a bullet list of some things. Um, that we've been doing. It's in your packet. I'm uh, happy to go through them and answer questions on uh, answer any questions that you guys might have on, uh, on anything, that, anything that I list here. Um, so I divided it up into, two, into three groups, uh, rules, systems, infra infrastructure, and national outreach. Um, so as far as our progress on rulemaking goes, we... If anybody has any questions, we assume sometimes that People know what administrative rules are and all that kind of thing. Does anybody have any question about that? I happen to serve on the administrative rules committee, which by many is considered to be a punishment duty. <laughs> so you all understand what administrative rules are. Okay. Well, the I mean the rules is the deliverable in our document, but what we need, what the department needs to do is build build an infrastructure and build systems and procedures for implementing the program. Um, the rules will make it law, but the program needs to be built internally with staffing, resources, um, the electronic, you know, data systems and whatnot. So a lot of this is happening simultaneously. Yeah, we get, so we do have a draft re patient registry rule that has been circulated internally and um, we continue to, to work on it. I, um, narrow issues down, have meetings on those particular issues. Um, so we do have an internal draft going. Um, we have a draft table of contents for our uh, alternative treatment center rules. Um, that's been completed and as we get more information we're filling pieces of it in. Um, but our focus now is on the patient registry rules. Um, last meeting we came, I came here and told you that our aggressive time, our proposed time frame um, for getting the draft rules to this committee, or this council, uh, <coughs> was going to be at our January meeting. <coughs> That's not going to happen. Um, it's just been, it, it's been, it's been slow going, and the, the rules are not ready um, for this committee, this council's review. Um, so we bumped that out a month, hopefully we can get, um, get a draft to the, uh, to the council by February. Um, and we'll we'll take it from we'll take it from there. <clears throat> um, in terms of uh, systems and infrastructure, in terms of uh, I'm sorry, I just have a quick question for sure, you, um, and that is, 
I, I just want to clarify, are, are the rules that we're going to be proposed in February, is that just the patient registry rules or Correct. is that, okay, so it's not, although the ATC rules have been completed, we're still not likely to see those until May? Um, no, I did not, I didn't say that. I, uh, the ATC rules have not been completed. Um, we have come up with a table of contents. Oh, I'm sorry, TOC table of contents, yes. Right. Understood, yeah. thank you. Uh, th <laughs> this was mostly notes for me, but then I figured it might be helpful to pass it out. So there may be some shorthand in here that, uh, you know, isn't, isn't clear. Um, so no, just the, um, the, the ATC rules, we have a year and a half to do. That was a much uh, longer uh, time frame. Um, that was May, June, that we would try to get them here. Um, in terms of uh, infrastructure and systems that we've been working on um, in the department, uh, as you all know, our web, a web page for the program has been, uh, has been created, so there is a public, um, there's a, a, a public presence for the therapeutic cannabis program on the department website. Um, it's got contact information, it has the ability to uh, for us to receive email, uh, questions via email, and also uh, there's a phone number for uh, people can call. Um, I've been getting a lot more calls and, and emails since that has been up, so that's been very, uh, that's been very, you know, public and useful. It also has a link to a dedicated advisory council page, uh, on which we have posted the minutes um, of <coughs> previous meetings. We've posted draft minutes um, before they've been adopted, and we um, also the information about next meeting is also is also on there. Um, and if the council has any suggestions on what else that they might want to uh, um, see up on that web page, feel free to let me know either you know in this forum or, or individually via email. Uh, we have repositioned a dedicated employee to serve as the program manager for the therapeutic cannabis program. Um, this is a part-time position as indicated on our fiscal note for House Bill 573, uh, but this individual is, um, is uh, dedicated solely to the program. There's a lot of people on the team. There's, as I said, it's a collaborative approach within, you know, with contracts and health facilities licensing and um, uh, rules and various senior management and IT people, um, but we have dedicated a, 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 a personnel to work on this program full time. Um, so that was a that was a big success for us to be able to get that done. Um, she's here today. Her name is uh, Christine Topham, and Hi. she's standing up in the in the it's audience nice to back see you there. And I look forward to working with you in the future. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Chris. Uh, on a, we're working on this. I mean, we're we have weekly meetings on this program. Um, we've uh, it's largely divided up between uh, bi-weekly meetings of a steering committee, and on alternate weeks we have a uh, <coughs> rules work group meeting, um, and that's in addition to meetings that we're having ad hoc um, on certain particular issues. Um, you know, uh, particularly with IT IT issues. We have been actively exploring hardware and software options for the electronic registry database um, and identification card printing. Um, that is the crux of the first set of rules in terms of our ability to implement the card registry, the patient registry uh, um, aspect of the, uh, of the program. And it also it, it involves, it involves money, it involves resources, it involves uh, staffing, so that's that's been our uh, that's been our number one priority, because um, the, the the system's functionality will dictate uh, what's in the rules. So those need to be developed hand in hand. Um, we've also conducted an, uh, some national outreach. We've contacted all the other states in the country that have a medical marijuana program. Um, we have uh, we have contact sheets for uh, you know program managers throughout the throughout the country. Uh, we've reached out to them. Um, solicited feedback, best practices, um, pitfalls, challenges that they've faced, um, and we're compiling that information um, as it comes in. Um, we have had conference calls with Vermont, Illinois, and Arizona, um, and we have a call with Connecticut scheduled um, for after the holidays. And right now our focus, as I said, has been on IT and their basically their database systems and how they track patients and caregivers, how they, um, 
you know, keep them confidential, what kind of systems they're using. Um, and we've got a lot of great information. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're debating, we're, you know, we're debating, do we build the system ourselves? Do we try to borrow a system that's used by someone else? Um, you know, these are, these are the things that we have to weigh in terms of, uh, in terms of cost uh, and functionality. I have a question. Are you going to get any input from the providers who are going to actually be using the system in in that aspect of it? The pro uh, the medical providers, like like the information from the other states, how things are working and stuff, and uh, like how user friendly their systems are for providers to actually like interface with this kind of system. Because that's that's, that's the main kind of uh, just of the, the providers are going to actually be referring the patients for the cards. So, like, that's the kind of thing. Are you going to get any, so is the input going to come from this committee to what you're going to choose, or are you going to give us any of that information well, that you're receiving from these other states, or are you guys going to just take that information and make a decision? Well, there's a lot of, a lot of questions there. Yeah. Um, for, for one, the, um, just some, some factual things. The, uh, a patient's physician is not responsible for getting us information. It's all on the patient. The patient needs to be sending us um, will need to send us um, an application packet. Um, the provider does not have to do that. The provider will have to write a written certification. Right. Um, my guess is that this is all going to be on paper. Uh, we were talking with Arizona um, just this past week, and they have what sounds like a fantastic system where everything is online, payment is online, automatic responses, um, but they also have um, 40,000 patients, um, and they've processed 100,000 applications. Doing, doing it by hand for them was not an option. Um, that also comes with a lot of cost. Um, so that's an option for us to consider, um, but it may well be a paper, a paper system as well. So in terms of, our, in terms of this database that, we're, that we need to build, there's no, unless it's a web base where people can apply online, um, and that hasn't been decided. Um, but if it's not a web-based system, there's no access from the public, from providers, to um, into the into the system. Um, you know, for for one, it's you know uh, all the information on it is it needs to be, remain confidential. Um, so that's that's part of your question. Mm -hmm. So the the second question was, are we going to be sharing any of the information from the states that you get with the committee? Like, is that just you're just going to make the decision internally, or are we going to yeah. hear any of that? We're, we're, I imagine that, unless specifically asked, we're going to make these decisions ourselves. I mean, it has to do with staffing. It has to do with funding. Um, is there a best practice? Well, there may be a best practice in terms of uh, having everything be online, but that may not be feasible um, fiscally, um, and it may not be it may not be reasonable to do that considering you know, the small number of patients we're expecting here compared to Arizona, which has, you know, 40,000, um, and growing by 1,000 per month. Um, so I don't anticipate that being a topic where we're going to seek the council's input. Um, but if, you have, if you've done your own research on what other states have been doing and what you think has, has been working as a, as a good model, um, we're happy to, to accept that input. Well, I'm just curious. It is like a, so it's a medical reason that people are having this. <laughs> so you, it's, I compare it to like someone who designs a hospital who's never ever worked in one. I mean, the nightmare of going into a place <laughs> that isn't even had had an input from people who are actually going to use this system. So that that's what I'm thinking of. You know what I mean? Talking about providers, you're, you're talking about qualifying. Uh, People who have a qualifying condition, that, that's what the doctors or nurses um, decide. But you're talking about the users of the system and their input, is that? Yeah, and I, I mean, I've, you know, it's fine to design a system that you think maybe isn't going to be used, or, but I think a lot say of you do grow are, and you're going to be stuck with a system that you really, who wants to be pushing paper on? I mean, it should be designed around an electronic system. That's, and I know co costs are a, a constraint and stuff, but I think to plan it where people are going to be sending in applications and you're going to have a file of pit. That doesn't sound very, like, you can keep things confidential 
I mean, it's, it's almost seems like you have to design it electronically to be, you, you know what I'm saying? Like, I just don't want you to uh, underthink of the potential of what you're gonna have and then all of a sudden say, oh my God, there is 40,000 people in this state that meet the criteria and you're gonna have to deal with that. And that's gonna be another nightmare. Instead of just planning ahead and saying, you know what? Let's just design a system that can expand if it needs to expand or stay small if it does, but at least it's a tidy system that actually works. These are all considerations that we're, you know, uh, you living, so, living with, yeah. you know, on a weekly basis at the department. Yeah. Um, I don't need to, I don't need to remind us that yeah. this came with no money. I There's know. no seed money here. It needs to be self-supported. So, and it needs to be supported, you know, all the seed money needs to be general fund money. So, there's there's difficult there's difficulties with finances, <coughs> certainly, are challenges. Um, but no, they, these these are issues that we that we're considering actively. Mm -hmm. This is what we're spending our time talking about. Mm -hmm. If I hear you right, I think you're saying that that we should be getting in, input from the individuals who are going to be using the system, <coughs> partly. And I, and I think I, I don't know if all these people are going to be using the system, but I think that they're very concerned and that's why people are showing up so I think your point is well, well taken. I mean and you're looking at the people who use it are, are sick people you know so sure. you don't want somebody to have to be like you know oh my god it's another paper or that, like another you know you don't want it to be so cumbersome that it's difficult for them to actually apply for it and get it that's that's so I mean I would be happy to like look and help I mean if you want input from our committee I mean I'm happy to to look at things and say well this is what we're thinking is this cumbersome for somebody who maybe can't you know function on a daily basis because they're so ill? But that's the kind of thing I'm saying. You know, sure. Um, that, I mean, the difficult the application process um, will be detailed in the rules. Um, there'll be opportunities for public comment on you know on the application process itself. That's what yeah. that's what the first set of rules will be about. Mm -hmm. um, the idea that the system <laughs> is going to be used by anyone besides HHS. Is something that I like to put. It's it's unlikely that our database. We're talking about a database mm -hmm. of information that we need to track patients, um, their qualifying conditions, their providers, etc. That is confidential information, and we don't. We're not looking to. It, I suppose it's possible that it'll be web based, but I think that's a web based system is is an, is, is an outlier. Um, the, uh, the likelihood is that this is going to be a paper process, a paper application process. So talking about a system and its user friendliness, the electronic database system will not be being used by patients. <coughs> so, but I, but I hear what you're saying, and these are things that we need to consider. You know, I, yeah, if, if we could have a web-based system, I think that would be fantastic. Um, but I don't know if we can build it. Mm -hmm. Dr. Glassman. Well, Devin was first. Devin, need a one. Okay. Yeah, so, so glad uh, to hear you um, say multiple times the words confidential information and, and limited who will have access uh, to the database because I think I've, I've brought this up before, but we'll be bringing it up again. So just we are, you know, I am concerned when, when you talk about the database and what systems you're using and when you're talking to other <coughs> states that have used similar programs. Um, <coughs> You know, we will be looking at, when, and especially once the regulations are available, um, you know, we will be looking very closely at how you're planning to maintain that confidentiality to make sure that only those that need to have access to the system, even within HHS, right. not to mention outside, only those people who need to have access to it are having access to it. And I'd be, you know, I don't know if you've learned anything thus far from your conversations with other states. If so, you know, would definitely be interested in hearing. Um, and that's certainly something that you know we'll think more about. I will take some responsibility to think more about if we have any suggestions as far as some you know, some model rules for ensuring that privacy is protected, ensuring that that confidentiality is protected. Thank you. So, with the three states you spoke to, any sense of startup cost to get things off the ground? What did they? What were their cost? Was that ever discussed at all? Just so everyone in the room sort of knows what we're looking at. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not prepared to you know, offer, offer numbers. Um, we, they may have touched upon them, but it wasn't a focus of, of, of the conversations. Okay. Um, you know, we, we just talked with Arizona this, uh, this past week, and they were charged with getting their registry database up and running within 120 days of their law being passed. And they succeeded. Um, 
they have they had um, four dedicated program planners working on it in addition to another at least another four people um, database managers they ha the, that state has an infrastructure for all their applications already for all their programs so building a separate module for this for this program was was possible mm -hmm. um, there was a there was a framework already um, so I mean that, that we were uh, we were on the phone and just our jaws dropping you know 120 days to get this up and running um, it, it just seemed it seemed seem crazy um, but they yeah they had they had dedicated personnel we in this state have to deal with another another state agency the Department of Information Technology to do any kind of information technology work so the idea of us building our own system includes costs extra costs um, and it includes um, <coughs> scheduling availability of resources within another department so that's another challenge um, with doing you know building our own system um, so uh, in talking with um, in talking with Vermont, um, it seemed, sounded like they have a fairly rudimentary system um, that we would not want to model. Um, they were discussing their problems with um, getting historical data. Their database is point in time, and um, they they have a hard time getting historical data out out of it. So uh, that model isn't gonna that model certainly won't work for us. Um, both Vermont and Arizona. Um, have requirements that need to provide access 24-7, either web-based or through phone call, to law enforcement. Um, we don't have that requirement here. Um, so that was a feature that needed to be built in to, uh, to, the, to those, those other states' um, information systems. <coughs> um, you know, it's possible that our state will require that at some point in the future. So that's something that we're really conscious of in terms of being able to build out that access. That's what you say. You know, we don't want to have to start from scratch if that's something that we can anticipate as a possibility. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, that's something that we're, you know, kind of in, in the back of our minds about. Um, we don't want to, you know, eliminate that possibility. So, Jim has a look of I, concern. I, I do. I just want to clarify because you you made a couple of remarks. That, having to, that, that made me think a little bit more about the privacy and confidentiality issue. One is, I'm thinking about why you need, how long is this information going to be be uh, be held on to by HHS? Is this something that's going to be held on to indefinitely? That seems, when you talk about historic, because you talked about the importance of retrieving historical data, that would seem not only unnecessary, uh, but also potentially would put at risk, you know, unnecessarily someone's privacy down the line. If somebody hasn't been receiving medical marijuana for 10 years, why are we holding, are we going to be holding on to that information? And, and if so, why? And I'm also a little concerned with the idea that, you know, the law doesn't currently provide for anyone outside the department to have access to that issue, that, to that information. And I hope that, you know, that that system's not going to be building in that type of access. Um, but you know, because I think we would have serious concerns. With them. Right. I'm I'm raising these issues as issues that have come up, you know, with other states. Um, the example of Vermont was that we were asking them questions of like, well, how many people, you know, signed up when the program first went live? I said, wow, oh, we really can't run those reports. We really don't know. Um, it'd be helpful to have to know, you know, in. 2002, how many people they had, and what's the growth rate? So it's 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 those kinds of things that we just want to be um, made aware of. That yeah, we may want to be able to do some you know reporting. We have to report out to various number of people. But just to quickly distinguish aggregated data from identifiable data, yeah. and that's probably that I thought. Yeah. There there is legislation coming into this upcoming session, and uh, if there are some. Uh, uh, well thought through amendments, but we've got the vehicles to, uh, I, I know one of them has already come to my, uh, uh, one of Ted's uh, uh, fairly easy um, bills that deals with the chiefs of police as a member. Uh, that, so we, that wouldn't be an appropriate one to attach to, but there are some others. Uh, uh, Just uh, trying to be cognizant of the resource limitations. Everybody's trying to do their best here. But thinking about the role of this committee, um, 
what's what would be important things for me as a member to know if I, you know, just my input into this would would be, you know, how are we defining success of this program up front? Um, and that would mean access, that would mean satisfaction. And if, I think the sooner that we establish some some measurement for that, the better, because we could get down the road and then be in the same situation where we just don't have the data mm -hmm. to determine that level of success that we that we defined up front. And the other interesting information would be access uh, from a geographic standpoint. Um, how, how do we situate this in such a way that, that different parts of the state have access? And the third piece is the education piece of the providers and the consumers of this. How does that, how do we um, make some kind of provisions for, for that to happen? Those, I, don't, I don't need to see the details of, of that, but just overall, what, is, what are our goals and how do we measure them? It seems to me to be what would be important. Yeah, th this is coming up every single time, so I think I'd better take responsibility for that and not expect the department to do that and see if we can get some experts to come in and tell us uh, mm -hmm. on a national level um, what other states have done. Uh, and, and, and I agree with Mike, there are some states that I would not want to emulate. Uh, uh, and, uh, and anybody that knows the New Hampshire legislature knows that issues around uh, Confidentiality and uh, privacy are major. And the quickest way to get a program killed is not to pay attention to that. So, uh, but what, let me um, see as quickly as we can get some people in uh, that can talk to us about these issues and their experiences in other states and use either the National Governors Conference or the, or the National Conference of State Legislators but, uh, the advantage we have of that is we don't have to pay them uh, to come here. Uh, uh, but, but we're hearing that so often, Chief. I had uh, a couple of questions for Mike. Um, one, um, you, I understand about how OIT is separate, and so now you have to go through another agency. Do they charge you for that time? Is that billed against your HHS? Unfortunately, I'm not intimately familiar with how those that interagency arrangement works. I, I don't know. Um, if we need if we need servers, if we need hardware, yeah, it would certainly be um, a cost to us. Um, I don't know if they bill us okay. by the hour or anything like that. I know some self-funded agencies have to pay for everything out of their budget. So yeah, I, I don't know. And that's something we could have a little talk with the governor about. Well, I just when you talk about the financial impact, I think it might be helpful for people to realize that it's not just personnel, there's hardware and services that you may be billed against other things. And it may not be because this isn't a this is a self funded. I know like police standards and training is self funded, so anything they do, they're billed. Like even if they cut a check, they get a bill from administrative services. But um and the second thing I had was, and it goes back to the question somebody had about what other states are doing and whether you present it. I kind of get it for the database part of it because it's really what you are going to be using internally, what you have to feel comfortable is going to serve your needs. But I think as we're coming forward and we're going to be asked for decisions uh, related to like the rulemaking, for example, I don't think it, I think it would be helpful for us to hear what you got for responses from other states as to what worked, what didn't work, what needs to be, not just here's what we're proposing. You know what I'm saying? I, I do. I don't know what capacity we're going to have to be able to, I mean, we're trying to, we're trying to build a program. Um, you know, it's, it's odd that, I mean, this is an advisory council in terms of trying to advise the department. Um, but we've spent most of our time at these meetings with the department telling you, telling <coughs> the council things. Um, so it, there's, a, there's a bit of a... It, and that's why I bring that up. If we're going to be advising you, we ought to be having facts so we can make decisions, not just rubber stamping what you're presenting without, without a, in a vacuum, if you will, not rubber stamp, <coughs> operating in a vacuum. We should have maybe some access to, you know, some highlights as to what you found out. I mean, if you're getting information, I don't see why you couldn't maybe share that with us as to what 
why you picked a certain path to go down with the rules? Uh, well, it's, it's something that I can take back to the department and, um, and, and address internally um, and, 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 see, and, see, and see, what the, see how the department at large feels about, about that. I mean, we have, you know, there's only a limited amount of time um, and we haven't made any decisions or we made limited decisions. Um, so I, I hear what you're saying. I guess I'm not asking for anything you're not getting. You know what I'm saying? I'm not asking you to create something. This is information you got from Vermont. Okay. What was that information? You know what I'm saying? I'm not asking. Well, I guess I would ask you do you, do you have, a, do you have a, um, a desired format in which you would like to receive uh, that information? I, I guess, going back to what I said, if there's a reason you picked something or didn't pick something, I, I guess some justification, not just these are the rules. And, you know, if we're going to be advising, I think we need to have. Some information. Yeah, I, I hear your concern, and that is that, and I can guarantee from my point of view, I'm not a, a person that's just going to say, fine, the department wants this. I think we can have a discussion with the commissioner, because what Mike is talking about is from the point of view of being stressed, and the whole department is stressed. So he's not looking to have or burden him more than he's already burdened. I mean, then, and that's a fair enough uh, position. Uh, but I agree with you that we've got to have information and data uh, so that the fact that we've got somebody now helping us, uh, that, that may take off some of that burden. Uh, uh, and as I've said before, almost everybody <coughs> in the department now is doing at least two jobs <coughs> so that the, the, the stress is there in that department, and it's probably there in every department uh, in the state. Uh, but you're right. Uh, otherwise, you're saying, what the hell's the purpose of us being here if, if we don't get that information to, to have an um, educated position on giving advice? Uh, the commissioner has indicated he'd be glad to come back at any time, so we could do that. Um, and, uh, and I'm not trying to uh, go up <coughs> your table up there, but uh, the commission is very interested in this particular uh, program, and I think it's partly because of his business background, so he sees it as a business model. Uh, but he wants this to go. Uh, he also wants it to go as quickly as possible for, for a less than obvious reason, and that is there's no money coming in until we get some of these forms and regulations in place and then the money starts coming into the department. Uh, so here we are halfway through the, the fiscal year with no money coming in at all. Do you have any thoughts, Curtis? Well, I have a uh, question maybe for Mike. Um, <coughs> might help clarify this. Uh, are you, the information that you get from a state, is it typically on the phone or is it through email or do they send you sources or links or? Anything like that? Yep. We have had <coughs> three conference calls with three different states. Mm -hmm. um, one of them is Illinois, who passed their law this year. Mm -hmm. um, so it was more of a meet and greet. What are you, how are you approaching this? How are, kind of thing. Um, conference calls with Vermont and Arizona have been calls, and we're taking. We're taking notes as you know. We've got a list of questions about IT. Um, we're taking notes. Um, they, when we ask for their RFP for their ATCs, for example, they'll send us them, or they'll direct us to their websites um, with information that's available publicly. Um, they've indicated if you have any specific questions, feel free to contact us via email or phone, and we can you know engage in a discussion or email discussion. Uh, on that, um, states that have do have annual reports um, that are published, we've been gathering that information as well. So, um, I mean, no state has sent us links to their newspaper articles in that state um, saying that uh, you know the people don't like it or the people love it. Yeah. So I, I'm not sure. You know, that's kind of <coughs> a roundabout way of answering your question, I suppose. No, that's fine. I, I'm just trying to get a feel for what type of information you're receiving. I mean, if it was something that was mostly electronic, you could just easily pass it on to us. But if it's phone calls and 
and handwritten notes, then it becomes a little bit more complicated. It becomes problematic right. in that it, then it would take you know even more time to sure. compile those in a way that can be presented. So that we're at the beginning stages of of, of, of research. We're mm -hmm. researching other other states. Um, um, so the deliverable will be the rules. Man, uh, would it help? Do you think if a member of the council was involved directly with your weekly meetings or something like that? I I don't know. Okay. Um, I would have to if if that's a request of the council, I would need to bring that to the department um, for for consideration and approval. It, it certainly wouldn't be up to me. Um, these are working meetings. I sure. mean, these are. How are we going to run that, and who's going to do it? You know, and so input in term, input from a council member on, 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 on those kind of, that in the weeds kind of programmatic. How are we going to operationalize this? I don't see. I was thinking the other way. So the flow of information would come to us through a liaison or something like that. It's just a thought. Do you volunteer right there? <laughs> <laughs> Weekly meetings. <laughs> open up. Buy the bi weekly ones. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have to think about it. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I'm, he I'm hearing what you're saying. I'm hearing what you're saying. These are things that I can bring back to the department. Mm -hmm. And as you know, I, we, we meet weekly. That, and part of our meeting on Monday or Tuesday will be discussing what was discussed here. So I mean, I can bring these issues back to uh, to the department and and see, you know, see what they say, mm -hmm. and see if they have any thoughts. Um, you know, obviously, a need uh, or a desire is being expressed here for a more intimate look at our internal processes for how we are conducting our research and building the program. I'm not. Sh I, I can't say whether or not that would be amenable to the department. At, at the risk of shooting my mouth up too much. I I'm wondering if that's a good use of time. Uh, if if we had a description of from someone about how, uh, the different programs that were looked at, four, five, six programs, the approach they took, and the approach that's being recommended for New Hampshire, and then <coughs> a list of ten ways that we're measuring success. Um, that to me would be a good way to use this committee versus are getting engaged in the in the detail of you know what what's going on in the phone calls and that sort of thing I, I know that's not the, the intent is to bring it back here right but um, it but ha having some idea of how what what how our approach relates to what's going on or what's been in other states and what's been ruled out and what's best for us would be it doesn't have to be a a white paper it could be a description of it. That'd be useful. Mm -hmm. I think going to number nine of our charge, it says the sufficiency, the sufficiency of the regulatory and security safeguards contained in this chapter and adopted by the department to ensure that access to and use of cannabis cultivated is provided only to persons authorized for such purpose. I mean, that's part of the, the, the rules and stuff, and that's part of our charge. So I think I'd be very uncomfortable just get a set of rules and saying this is the rules we're proposing. Do you approve them or not? And this is, I want to know why and why other states have seen pro and con, whether there's been issues with access that shouldn't be because of the way it was worded or or dis, or diversion because of the way something was worded. I, I think that's that's right in our charge. And I think you should have, I'm not asking to get into your internal process per se, as far as like like I say, the in, the IT part of it that's your business because it, it's a database. It's only going to be used by you theoretically for your internal and whatever generating whatever data you need to generate your reports as required by the statute. But I think for what we're charged with doing, um, which is talks about the regulatory and security safeguards and diversion, I think we need to to have a little more information than just these are the rules. You know, I think we need to see what other states have where diversions happen in other states and how, and what you've done to make sure it doesn't happen here. What would be helpful is if you wanted to 
if anyone, any person in this council wants to do their own research on regulatory safeguards in terms of prevention of diversion and present that to this group or to the department directly. I mean, the, the, I mean I, I'm not the chair, you know. Other states' models have, uh, you know, have worked or they haven't worked. And, you know, any, any, any person on this council is welcome to go out and do the research um, and, rec and make recommendations. Colorado had this example, you know, Maine had this example, and provide us, provide the department and this council with, in, with information, make recommendations. Um, you know, I'm just trying to, you know, just tr trying to turn it, turn it a little bit over on the other side where. Um, I, I understand that, and, and I've done some of that. Yeah, I've sent some. That stuff absolutely, to and it's everything, well, everything that people have sent has been very helpful. But my point is, when we get the rules that you're going to propose, it'd be kind of helpful, I think. For those that may not be accessed to some of that, to have an idea, because we're going to be all of us going to be taking a vote on those rules. You know, that's all I'm saying. I, I'm not asking really to get in too far into the weeds, but I need <coughs> at least a little more information to make our decision. As you said earlier, it's kind of unusual in that we're presenting something for you to approve. Well, I think we, should, in order for us to approve something, we ought to have not just have something in front of us, have some why you did it, maybe. You know, I'm not asking for any great detail, but I, I think I'm not trying to get too into the weeds and how you operate. Uh, I'm, I'm trying not to do that. I understand. I deal with HHS on other aspects, so I know how shorthanded you are and, and all that. But I do think for us to make an informed decision, we need some data and information, too. That's all. Sorry. And I, I think I'm hearing this from almost everybody. That, that, um, it, it makes little sense to have an advisory committee unless we have information coming to us that's uh, pertinent to our role uh, and, and not to be faced with a finished product. Uh, and, and that's what often happens with administrative rules. Of course, then it comes to the committee, but it's a late stage then to change things. So the question is how to get information <coughs> in some reasonable way that's useful to us. Uh, and also to get information from national sources that, that aren't the states themselves, but that somebody else has evaluated those programs and give us that kind of information. Uh, but I actually like this discussion because you know, people are saying, you know, we want to hear more, we want to be more involved and we want to be involved now, uh, so that's a very positive uh, position for everybody to take. And I, I'm sympathetic with Mike because I know the strain that's on the department. So the question is how to get a balance between those two um, situations. It's the question about having a staff person, at least part-time, dedicated to this is a very positive change, I think. Um, and, um, and I suppose the department is proprietary, you know, they, they, they've got a process that they um, have followed for years. Um, um, but let me do some talking with the department to see if there's some way we can ease the pressure onto Mike and but get information to us. Um, some of the information that Mike gets may be things we don't want to hear anything about. You know. It may not be as pertinent as what some of the national organizations have been able to come up with that we could get, which would also um, help the department simultaneously. Uh, <coughs> right now, we don't have another scheduled meeting till February, and, and that's to give me and some others some time to, uh, to get more information <coughs> and have the process go forward. Uh, but, but what I'm hearing is there's some concern that the department is not going to just go straight ahead on their own and not listen to anybody. You know. and that has not been my experience with the department, and it's not what I expect, but others here haven't um, had that uh, experience in the past. And 
So we need to calm down that concern that, uh, and see what information we can get. Uh, and, and this is a much more lively discussion today than we've had so far. And I would just add to that that I do hope that you do see us as a resource as well. Um, and, and as the chairman said, some, you know, that we can ease your burden by do as you and as you said, my good, by doing our own research. And it's good, it's good for us to know from you that you are open and, and interested in, you know, receiving. I, I want to make sure that whatever we pass on to you is in a form that's going to be helpful instead of frustrating or sort of oh, we don't you know overwhelming. Um, but certainly, you know, it, I will certainly go back from this meeting and give some serious thought as to what particular issues we might be able to provide you with some information that might actually be helpful in the process you're currently engaged in. That, that sounds great. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and what I, what I said at the last meeting, and I'll say again, and some of you um, have provided me uh, with information on your own, independent of these meetings, um, and they've been extremely helpful. Um, and I urge you to continue sending me links to articles from other states or audit reports of, of, of other programs. Um, those things, those things are helpful. Um, so if you think about, you think about why each one of you is a member of this council, and think about your perspective and your expertise and your, con your concerns as, as a particular member and take those topics and then th think about those topics and think about how you can use your specialty, your area of expertise to help the department inform us of, of issues that we need to be aware of and recommendations and experiences of other, other places. Think about that and, you know, provide us with as much information as, as you care to. Um, that's what would be most helpful for us. So those who have sent me things, thank you, and please continue to do so. There is information. The, the, the Institute of Medicine in 1999, I think it was, put out a book called the uh, the science behind medical marijuana. It cost fifty dollars, so I didn't buy it yet. But, but there's data out there. There's information out there. Uh, in fact, the last NCSL bulletin that came out, uh, and I, it's, it's probably in, in my office, it has a whole series of references mm -hmm. that that we might be, as a group, uh, be willing to take a look at. So um, there was a toxicology lecture last week at Dartmouth. And what you need to understand is that the potency of marijuana now is much higher than it was back in the 1990s. So the side effects could be very different now than what they were seeing 15 to 20 years ago. Um, so just understand that given it's that old, what, what's changed is, is what's in this product that is going to be available. and, and, and there may not be any research right now as to what those effects really are right now. So understand what you look at has to be understood with the fact that it's not apples to apples now. It is different. Yeah, that's why I said 1999. Right, right. which was 15 years ago. Right, yeah. almost. Yeah, I, I would hope maybe they kind of take another look at that. Right, right. But you're right. Yeah. So, and I would imagine the dispensaries are, that's what they, it's not, off the street drugs. So the dispensaries are actually having the specific strains and it's grown under certain conditions and there's no contamination with anything else. So, I mean, there's plenty of research right now going on all over the world. So you can have the latest and greatest, you know, information on that. Um, you know, <coughs> that's what they do. Uh, you can actually access through the National Academies Press uh, free version PDF <coughs> download of the Institute of Medicine's uh, mm -hmm. book. And uh, it, it's very informative, although it contradicts some of the prior uh, data that was put out there. Is there anything after 1999? Well, that was an extremely expensive project project for them to go through. They, they tend to do them every 20 years, it seems like. I mean, I think the previous one by the, uh, 
Institute of Medicine was in the early 80s. So I wouldn't expect to see a lot of, you know, they're redoing a lot of stuff that, that was already previously done. So, I, you know, I, I think that debate about potency is, is, uh, it's kind of outside the context of what the book is about, mm -hmm. what the science is about. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Okay. Where, where are you at? I think you pretty much finished. Uh, I, yeah, I finished this document. Next time, just stay there. Oh, uh, no, that's the front page. Um, the last document that I have in this packet is just a, a legislative update. It compiles a list of the five bills that are related to therapeutic cannabis um, that have um, been posted online. Uh, three of them have, um, have been assigned a, a bill number, two um, still appear in LSR format, um, and they are um, and they're listed here. The first two on the, uh, on the page are the legislation that this council has endorsed. Uh, third, I believe, is Representative Wright's um, <coughs> bill, um, and there's uh, there's another one sponsored by Representative Wright, and another one sponsored by uh, Representative Schlockman, having to do with um, um, advertising, uh, ATC advertising restrictions. Okay, so 1296. Uh, I've got that on my committee, uh, and I put a positive sign next to that one. Uh, uh, that seems to me. To, uh, now the next one is Senate, so I don't know where that's at. Um, do you know where 1616 <coughs> went? I, I, oh, 1616. I, I haven't heard yet. Uh, this is the first I've seen of, of these actually with a with, the with a bill number on it. That's either me or judiciary, I would say. Yeah. Um, okay, right. Still right, the one of them is the home cultivation option. Yeah. And that's the advertising one. Okay. Right. Uh, the, the bills are just, we just got them uh, last Tuesday. We're just beginning to process those. We can't put them up for scheduling until they're introduced on January 8th. Um, we will start working on that unofficially, uh, so that you'll see legislation start um, probably on the Tuesday, the, the next Tuesday after the 8th, I think you'll start seeing committees start working on this legislation. Uh, and so that with some of these, if there are pressing issues that you know about that seem to be developed enough, they, those things can come in as amendments. Uh, to this. Um, I don't anticipate that uh, um, like, like a bill that brings in homegrown is going to go anyplace uh, in this session. And that just happens to be my <laughs> friend's bill. But, uh, uh, and he knows that that's very unlikely. Uh, and the reason that's unlikely is because if we passed it, the governor will veto it. Uh, and we can't override the veto, uh, but uh, but that doesn't mean you don't try. Okay. And it, any questions about how the <laughs> the legislature operates with the, any of these things? That you know, the Senate, if, if those bills start over there, if they work on those at a certain point, at this point. All the House bills that are still alive go to the Senate. All the Senate bills come over to us, and, uh, and that's, I don't know, but probably April, to March, I don't know. 
You know what? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We were looking at, well, with last year, SB 409, we were in May, I think, when, the, when we were finally. Right. Come over. <coughs> okay. Uh, Eric Acosta. Yes. Yeah. Uh, taking notes and observing, and she's asked for a chance to speak. She did speak briefly last night. So basically, the, the, the message that I conveyed to Erica was to not bring up stuff she's already brought up, but bring us something new. Uh, it, it may be uh, different for some committee members, but my position is that public input is always important, that we cannot um, try to squelch the, uh, public input. <coughs> Sometimes it makes the meeting go longer, but that uh, I, I will always make time for people in the public to give somebody who comes to the So, go ahead. Thank you. Um, my name is Erica Golter. I wanted to thank you for allowing me to speak today. You guys have done um, a tremendous amount of work. You're certainly dedicated, and um, you know we're well on our way. <clears throat> um, I am the director of New Hampshire Normal. When I was combing through the New Hampshire law and understanding what it is that your committee is responsible for, <clears throat> um, I was building a survey of suggestions that would help <coughs> develop areas in your program. I collected input from hundreds of respondents in the last few weeks. We found some interesting issues. Before you go too far, could you tell us something about your organization? Certainly. Like, um, normal New Hampshire Normal. Uh, normal is a national organization for reform of marijuana laws. Um, New Hampshire Normal is the state chapter for um, national normal. And, um, okay, so. I have been looking at your therapeutic cannabis program diagram and it seems based on this diagram that a patient has an eligibility, they get certification, um, then they can register, they're issued a card and then you have the registration of the alternative treatment centers and those things open, right? That's correct? Okay. Um, even if patients get their eligible patient card today, they can't obtain medical cannabis. In order for patients to exercise their rights, they're going to have to break the law. <clears throat> Based on what we've seen in other states with similar conditions, it's reasonable to assume that, we'll, that there will be five to 10,000 new patients in the first two years while we're waiting for dispensaries to open for legal obtainment. The New Hampshire state law says patients and caregivers can't cultivate, but they can acquire. Pursuant 126-X1, which is the definitions, uh, number eight, therapeutic use means the acquisition, possession, cultivation, preparation, use, delivery, transfer, or transportation of cannabis or paraphernalia relating to the administration of cannabis to treat or alleviate a qualifying patient's qualifying medical, medical conditions or the symptoms or results of treated associated with the qualifying patient's qualifying medical condition. It shall not include the use of cannabis by a designated caregiver who's not a qualifying patient, cultivation or purchase by a visiting qualifying <coughs> patient, or cultivation by a designated caregiver or qualifying patient. So the question is, where do they acquire it from? It's illegal for anyone to sell it to them. It's illegal to cross state line, and um, they can't get it in other states legally. <clears throat> so um, to conclude that, I believe this hole, gaping hole, I, I think it's a gaping hole in the law. Um, it's what's happening now is the New Hampshire state law would create felons and um, promote the black market. Because caregivers cannot grow, patients would have to travel out of state to obtain their medicine. Uh, Maine has a reciprocity, which I, I'm sure you guys are familiar with. But this only means that they can have their own medical cannabis on their person with a New Hampshire card. However, if patients cross state line with cannabis, they break federal law because they're crossing state line, which subjects them to DEA jurisdiction. <coughs> because patients can't obtain medicine in a safe, legal way, we will either be creating thousands of felons 
who would sell the medicine to caregivers and patients who need this medication to survive and or prevent suffering. Therefore, the law currently promotes development of a black market in New Hampshire because thousands of people have to obtain it from somewhere. Are the patients expected not, not to be able to obtain their medic medic medicine legally while they wait up to two years or more for an alternative treatment center to open? <clears throat> this is unconstitutional as seen in Nevada. To provide a law that allows for medical use of cannabis while simultaneously denying meaningful, meaningful legal access is clearly unconstitutional. <clears throat> Patients will risk poor quality medicine and it will be dangerous to obtain. Inconsistent and low quality cannabis that is dangerous to acquire will be the only option for New Hampshire until alternative treatment centers open, which won't be for approximately three years if you include the cultivation time. For example, a legally qualifying cancer patient will have to obtain her medical marijuana by buying it from the black market. There is no consistency, no proper strain for the specific ailment. There's no quality control and the marijuana may be laced with other drugs. And it is dangerous to obtain because this cancer patient will have to rely on seedy people who are willing to break the law and perhaps violate other laws. <coughs> In order for people to exercise their rights, they're required to break the law. Some qualifying patients will refuse to get a card before the ATC is open, and these people may die from their ailments before then. <clears throat> Not forgetting dispensary development barriers, cost of entry, cost of setup, location issues, unreasonably low limits for product and availability versus demand. It will take time to develop alternative treatment center regulations. During that time, patients will have no legal, no reasonable legal access to medicine and will be forced to break the law or turn to the black market. ACT regulations to be completed in 18 months, uh, the end of 2014, just for regulations. Then there's the bidding process and the implement implementation, the build out of the ATC, <coughs> setting up desks, computers, all of the plants, much has to be accomplished before they can even start to grow. Growing a single plant takes a minimum of nine months to obtain a fi finished product. <clears throat> I have a suggestion of patient caregiver um, solution until the treatment centers open. Um, <clears throat> the state of Nevada violated constitutional rights of patients who could not obtain their medicine legally until the dispensaries opened. Nevada allowed caregiver patient cultivation until the dispensary is open, sus suspending individual grows. Currently, Nevada allows seven plants, four seedlings, three mature plants. On January uh, 1st, 2014, the number increases to 12 plants. Right to grow will remain law once dispensaries open if a patient lives more than 20 or 25 miles from the nearest dispensary or if the patient can prove they have no transportation or way to get to the dispensary. This workable solution was implemented in Nevada. <clears throat> I know, um, I believe I had read that there was um, concerns about being able to regulate home grows and, and maybe being a law enforcement issue. Um, <clears throat> law enforcement is not allowed to regulate medical marijuana or prescription pills or pharmacies they are specifically prohibited from being involved in the regulation of an alternative treatment center as the law provides they are to be self-regulating. The current law provides that the law enforcement is able to file a request to a judge for a, sor for a search warrant upon reasonable suspicion or probable cause that the law is being violated. Adding, provision, adding a provision that allows patients and or caregivers to grow still provides law enforcement a way to conduct search should they obtain a search warrant. So your concern is from, from this point until the um, treatment centers uh, uh, go into operation, that, that uh, my recollection is that all of that testimony that the committee's heard, uh, uh, I, think it, I think Mitch Simon and some others made it very clear uh, the legislature decided not to do anything about that. Uh, and uh, there, there is a bill in to uh, uh, move towards the homegrown. Uh, 
uh, fairly quickly. The, the, the likelihood of that passing, I think, is not great. Uh, so that... Uh, I have other suggestions for okay. solutions. Okay. So those so far, they're uh, not going to go very far, I think. Right But the, these are strictly my own opinions, so that anybody else can chime in. Um, I have five solutions that we might consider. <clears throat> One is allowing the caregivers to cultivate and provide for the cardholders. One is allowing doctors to um, being allowed to distribute. One is allowing homegrown at three plants budding, three non-budding. Other states have this, and I'm not aware of any patient disobeying the 3-3 law or causing any problems in the com uh, community or using up police resources. Maybe suggest that home growers were, will consult professional electricians to ensure fire safety hazards, or they will consult, consult a licensed hydro place to ensure the safety of their home grow. Maybe we can suggest a very minimal amount of home grow plants on a trial basis, and if it becomes a problem, the issue will be readdressed in a three month time period. <coughs> Another option is that once a person becomes a card holder, we might suggest establishing a don't ask, don't tell policy. For example, since there's no option for legal card holders to get their medicine, suggest that card holders will be allowed to have an ounce or a it would be two ounces, whatever the state maximum is. If they're stopped by police or if the police go into their house, the police cannot ask where they got it from and the card holder is not under any legal ob obligation to tell them, don't ask, don't tell. The police will not be able to ask any info or how they got it. <coughs> Another suggestion would be um, is uh, suggesting that a patient can cannot be arrested for obtaining medical marijuana illegally, um, but don't forget, this still leaves your caregivers at risk for selling illegally. Anybody have any questions or comments? Well, I, I do see, I see, you know, that is a glaring hole in the, the whole process here. And, and I, le legally there is reciprocity to buy it, but that, that is the big problem is crossing state lines to, to obtain it. Um, you know, growing it at home, uh, allowing people to do that, that kind of solves that problem. But um, I guess we just have to work on the governor on that one and see if we can get the law passed and get her to sign it. And, you know, I think if um, that was a problem with the initial legislation, um, is the information that was given and, you know, you have to win that battle with the governor. I mean, this, it, we, we had to, do the same thing with Governor Lynch. I mean, they veto these laws, but they have to understand maybe the, the different perspective of the consequences of doing that and what they're putting people out there to Where do is break the law. turning thousands of patients into potential felons. So I, I guess that's the education. If we can get this law passed for homegrown, that will solve that problem, but we just need to, to, to you know, educate um, the governor on you know what the stakes are if that is vetoed <laughs> but I agree it is a big problem for people thank you Mr. Chairman it's a good time for me to describe my own cultivation <laughs> um, basically the way it works is uh, the way it, what I've written will limit patients to two plants two adult plants that's correct that's, coming in. Yeah. that's correct um, is it coming <coughs> Kind of what is one of those on the list with the number or not? But the uh, whole idea was to address this particular concern exactly, allowing patients uh, access immediately. And this is one of the things that we ran into with my wife was that we're forced into a black market situation where you're getting something from somebody that you can't trust. And either the source or how it's kept or anything, it's all vulnerable. So with this in mind, um, caregivers, with the, if this law passes, caregivers would be given the option to either work with the five to nine patients through the ATC or have one patient that they supply with <coughs> home cultivated. Um, they'll be able to grow two adult plants and six um, 
12 inch or lower seedlings. Uh, this gives you an option to where you have a uh, rotate so that one, even though an, a plant over 12 inches is considered an adult, the plant isn't viable until it's got flowers on it and those. So you could have one plant that's not flowering and one plant that is flowering and then you could keep a, a rotation. That, that's the idea uh, why, why I went with a smaller number of plants. If you work that, it should help. But um, <clears throat> it goes away as a, the ATCs come online uh, to a certain extent. If you, uh, if an ATC is within 30 miles of you, you won't be able to home cultivate. <laughs> Um, um, you know, uh, unless that changes, I don't know. <laughs> but that's basically it. Uh, the other, uh, the other thing that was a concern was keeping some kind of control over diversion, preventing diversion. Frankly, diversion's not coming from patients; it's coming from large-scale operations that have no other sort, no other. Um, we see a lot of it coming from the West Coast from what I understand, and that's a, a function of how the federal government has addressed this problem. By going in and shutting down dispensaries, you've got a grow operation that's got a tremendous amount of product and now no place to sell it. So what we're starting to see is they're shipping it nationwide. I mean, it's even come here to New Hampshire, is that correct? So really, patients aren't the issue. So. Um, I, I really was interested in getting law enforcement oversight so that they could have an inspection, but there's a great deal of pushback for that. So what I came up with on my own was to allow the local health officer to inspect those sites. And if they see something that's grossly out of control, they can go immediately to the local law enforcement and, and there's your probable cause. Do you have so, a, a proposed timeline for that? Like how often they show up and what the procedures? Yeah, it, it's quarterly, okay. at least quarterly. So with a, with a three to four month turnaround on, on a plant, okay. um, that gives them the ability to go in, you know, once or maybe even twice during, during a growth cycle. So, so that's a piece of legislation that's definitely coming in. Right. Uh, and uh, as of this moment, I don't know if it's on our list, uh, but if that means that uh, the bill will be heard. Every single bill in New Hampshire goes to the floor. So, so that there's, there's no way any chairman or anybody else can stop a bill from being heard. Uh, therefore, um, uh, the, and, and, and for the first time in my life, I voted for medical marijuana this time. My background is mental health and addictions. I've always been uh, concerned about expanding, to, uh, but a particular person helped to change my mind completely, which was another legislator who had cancer. Uh, so I'm very sympathetic to it, but my job is to stay in reality and, and kind of be aware of the struggle that <coughs> one is going to have. Our original bill in the legislature had homegrown, and it also had PTSD. Those two were taken out by the Senate. Uh, and it's, it's no secret that it was taken out because the governor said she'd veto the legislation if we didn't. So my position was let's get as much as we can while we can. She's the first governor that's ever supported any kind of medical marijuana treatment. So I'm not critical of her for that because she's the first one that ever gave us a chance. I think her position is pretty adamant uh, uh, on the subject, uh, but who knows? I mean, a different bill coming in with a lot of work done to it and may have some uh, um, a different attitude, uh, but this is so close to the discussion that we just had with her uh, that I would be very surprised uh, that to see uh, a change on her part. Uh, uh, but Do you think that maybe this, the positioning of the discussion, like 
you know, did you talk to her about when we release these cards, there's going to be no way for these six suffering, dying patients to obtain their medicine without breaking the law. I mean, but that I don't know. And my discussions with the governor's office were very brief, uh, and, and I was told pretty much that if we tried to do something different, there'd be a veto. Now, that's over with, right. and it's passed, and we now have law. And so we don't want to pretend that there's, there's no opportunity to, to go forward. Uh, uh, but I think there's a major burden uh, 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 to get that passed. Uh, so we, to my mind, it's very important what committee that goes to. And, um, and uh, I can probably find out fairly quickly where it's, I mean, every, um, just, you're on the bottom of the list here, I think, still. Yes. And, and it probably hasn't been assigned yet. For, you know. Right. Two thir uh, 2032. Yeah, so there's still, the, our process is the deputy speaker assigns bills to committees. Uh, <coughs> my position was anything to do with medical marijuana ought to come to the health committee. But uh, my positions don't always carry with me. <laughs> they have to look at the statute and see what part of the law gets changed, and certain committees have certain responsibilities. Mm -hmm. uh, so we may or may not get this. Uh, but it, because Ted has put this in, it, it'll be heard. And that means that everybody in this room that wants to come and testify can come and testify. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and clearly make your point. Uh, about the, um, see, from my point of view, the, the legislature said we, we want to see people get the treatment um, that, um, for that by marijuana uh, for individuals who need that. Uh, and, and in whatever way we can come up with to make this become legal and in operation, the quicker the better. But what you're hearing is that in, in terms of the administrative part of this, it's very slow. And as far as I know, there's no way to speed that up. Uh, uh, so it'll take months from now before um, it, it, this, it, you know, it's, it's, what I know your concern is, is that it elapsed time from now to when those dispensaries open. Uh, it'll take at least six months for, for Ted's bill um, to get through. Uh, It'll start in the House and then go over to the Senate, and there will be opposition to, mm -hmm. uh, to that. Um, but um, it, it seems to me that what you want is what Ted's bringing in, yeah. right. pretty much. So um, I have a, a couple things for you guys, um, a little more information, kind of an overview of what I just spoke on. You want to ask some, answer some questions? Then? Excuse me? You want to answer some questions? Certainly, yes. I just have just wanted just a couple of things that I wanted to comment on um, and, and to ask. And um, one is that I, I did want to recognize that patients did meet with the governor. I, I, I believe patients, in fact, very ill patients that are probably in the position where they very well may no longer be with us by the time the ATCs come on board and, and did vo voice those concerns. and. and Many of us are disappointed that those concerns didn't didn't resonate, um, and um, you know, and that we recognizing that we are where we are. Um, the other thing that I just wanted to mention, I, I you know, I heard you your recommendation about don't ask, don't tell, um, and uh, I know that there are many obstacles, uh, and, and and others on the committee would likely bring those up to um, the don't ask due to trying to govern whether or not the police ask certain questions or don't. I won't comment on that. But I will say that patients have a right not to tell. Um, they have a right to remain silent. And, um, and that may be something, uh, um, it's, it's not adequate, and I'm not suggesting that it is in any way, shape, or form. But certainly from the New Hampshire Civil Liberties Union perspective, it's, it's <coughs> education that we would be willing to engage in, and that I hope your organization would, con would um, consider engaging in as well, that patients have a right to exercise their right to remain silent and they don't have to say 
you know, where, where they received what they received. Um, it's not adequate protection, I, I understand that, um, but I just want to make that point clear that, that they do have that right under the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Thank you. One other comment or question? Yeah. The same thing comes up though with the ATCs. They have no legal way to get the stuff either, so it's really a moot point. I mean, they're gonna get it. There is a black market already, um, it's going to happen if it gets set up. So whether it's ATCs or home grow, I mean, the ATC has to break federal law and get in it anyways. We're not here to change federal law. We don't have an influence on it. So, but this let's conversation, drive on. excuse me, sorry. Um, this conversation wasn't about federal law. It was um, about the ability for patients to be able to obtain their medicine after their doctor has given them orders to be taking medical cannabis and they have been certified by the state and now they have the ability to obtain and know where to get it. Um, and I feel like, you know, it's gonna be a long time before the, the treatment centers open. Um, I feel like that's a really big public health issue, um, maybe a civil rights issue. I mean, I don't know how far that goes, but these are really big problems that, you know, that the committee, should definitely consider <coughs> moving forward. Let, let's get it clear. You're, you're saying that at some point a doctor <coughs> will say, because they, they don't prescribe <coughs> marijuana. They make the recommendation. Yeah, but they say you have a qualifying condition. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that then there's going to be a lapse from that point to the point when the dispensaries or I have a hard time calling them treatment centers because I don't think there's any treatment there but, or whatever you want to call them. There. So you're talking about that lapse in time. Well, from what I understand, according to this um, therapeutic diagram here that I was looking at in this packet, <clears throat> um, your process starts with eligibility and that is with the medical evaluation and the doctor tells you that you are eligible um, in fact, or makes that recommendation that you should try to be certified for uh, medical cannabis through the state. Um, once you get the certification from, a written certification from the doctor, you can then apply to the state um, for a card. Well, you've been certified, getting rid of cer written certification for the doctor. Now you have this card that's been issued to you and you have no way to exercise those rights other than breaking the law. Because the dispensaries are not open. Correct. Okay. And, and what is that time factor? I mean, we're talking six months or? Between the, sorry. Yeah, between the time, <coughs> you're talking about this process. So at some point that you, you're getting the, the, the card mm -hmm. and the qualifying condition, uh, and, and then <coughs> there, there's still a lapse between the time the dispenser opens. Mm -hmm. Any comment on that all in terms of the time factor? When the program, when all aspects of the program are fully operational, there won't be a lapse. Um, so, I mean, the issue, the issue is if cards are issued <coughs> prior to ATCs being operational, we have the pro we have the problem that you're describing. Right. Um, if cards are issued day X, I mean the lapse will be until the ATCs are you know can provide products. Right. Um, but those time frames are un are uncertain at this point. Right. Um, you know it. <coughs> And there, I mean, it's possible that there, you know, there will be no, I mean, we have statutory requirements for us to adopt rules on patient registry, you know, in a year, and then ATCs in, um, in 18 months. So the law presumes six months. <coughs> but there's, but there's a, pro, there's a, yeah, there's a problem mm -hmm. with this in that it does create, um, create this, this whole, this, uh, this illegal, uh, kind of gray area where how do patients get it if the department issues cards before the ATCs are up and running. Yeah, I just want to, because that, the whole introduction of if um, sort of 
raises a flag for me and just that I think that it was very intentional why the legislature did it that way because they wanted to get that protection. I realize it's not adequate, but my understanding is the legislature wanted to get that protection to the patients as soon as possible for possession. Now, it doesn't cover them, it doesn't it fully, and there are, are holes with it, and it's not completely adequate, but I think there was a reason why the legislature wanted the regs for issuing the cards out before because they knew it was going to take longer for the ATC and they wanted to make sure that the patients were protected as early. Well, that's a typical system that you're going to find in other states is that they do regulate uh, or develop, ad adopt the rules for the card system first and then the treatment center. Uh, the difference between other states and New Hampshire is many other states do have a home grow ability or another way for patients to obtain medicine and New Hampshire doesn't have that meaning the patients have absolutely zero legal way of obtaining their medicine for years um, and that leaves them susceptible to break the law if, if you know it's, it's not a good situation i don't think it'd be helpful to uh, have some this is where you know looking at what other states you're doing might be helpful mm -hmm. it, i don't know how many allow therape therapeutic use of cannabis mm -hmm. is it six ten i'm not sure 20. 20. If we had a, like, how did they get, how the other states get through this gap? Uh, well, no, like they, I said, Nevada had this problem. In, but seeing it as, in total, um, mm -hmm. of the 20 states, 15 of them did it this way, and five of them did it this way, it would give us a perspective as to what's reasonable. Mm -hmm. I like that input. Um, <clears throat> Nevada did have this issue recently, um, just in the past year. Um, patients, they had a card system for 13 years, and this is a, a, you know, as far as being able to provide medicine in a reason, reasonable and timely manner, it's, it's irrelevant. We're talking about, you know, positions of the law and, and, and the availability to the patients. But in Nevada, they had, um, I believe it was 13 years, they had a, uh, a medical system. Um, that would allow for medical marijuana, but no way for people to obtain their medicine because there was no home grow option. There was no other option. They were going through the same thing that New Hampshire is about to go through. Um, and it was a big problem in that state. And they had to overturn it and allow um, some alternative resource for these patients to obtain their medicine while you're developing the treatment centers for them to be able to utilize their certification. Did Nevada's law originally have both components, um, a card registry and a dispensary system, or did the dispensary system, uh, was the dispensary system added onto the law later? 13 years seems like a long time to be mm -hmm. sitting on a, um, a statutory responsibility to open up ATCs mm -hmm. and, not, and not follow through on that. Um, and perhaps you don't know the answer. Right, um, but other states have had that model where um, they have passed a medical marijuana law without without any ability for for growing. Um, Rhode Island, I believe, um, had had a card system without a ATC, without a dispensary system or a home grow system. Um, so there are other states out there that have gone through this, and basically they're saying, yeah, if you possess it, you're illegal, but if you buy it, you're breaking the law. Um, but isn't it in the, in the law that d the definitions so again, isn't it in the law that a patient and caregiver um, as a therapeutic use is to uh, possess, administer, like it covers all of that, right? The difference between buying and, and or delivering, transferring. I'm sorry. In our law, in the law, the the definitions for um, patient and caregiver, and what defines a patient, and what defines a caregiver, and what their rights are as a patient and a caregiver would allow them to purchase um, through a dispensary, but not. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I, I don't yeah, have yeah, the law in front yeah, of me. Yeah, purchasing from a dispensary would be perfectly legal. Right. Well, if they can't purchase it from a dispensary, I'm sure they can obtain it through the black market. So, I mean, I don't think that that's a, a reasonable system to be putting New Hampshire patients 
through without considering the changes that we could make to make it more of a positive <coughs> cannabis law. <coughs> I think that's because of Representative Wright's bill coming in, <coughs> that that opportunity is there. I don't think as a, as a advisory committee we can take a position that that's not part of our uh, role to take a position there uh, on this legislation. Uh, but it's there, and, and the time frame is such that uh, if there's a six months period of time in there, there there's enough time with this legislation to, to deal with that. Uh, so that I think that's where your energy ought to go to. I mean, we've heard your message, and, mm. and there is the legislation in there, uh, and. Uh, that there, there may be some innovative way. The governor loves that word. I just feel like the state of New Hampshire is setting themselves up for multiple lawsuits, you know? We can just assume how to do that. Well, well I, I yeah. too, also, but... Uh, so, uh, I think uh, that President Wright has given you, and I know the two of you work together anyway, so that, that has given you the opportunity to hear that message, and then we'll see what the legislature does. Uh, uh, and, uh, and I think it's been mentioned that the, the governor is probably key to this. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And you said that anybody can go and speak when you... Well, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we are, you know, the hearings are yeah. open to the public. Yeah, we've had, I've seen hearings go till 1 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. So in, in, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you for your comments. Just to clarify, as of the last meeting as well, therapeutic cannabis is not a medicine. It's not approved by the FDA as a medicine, so to use that term is not correct. Right. It's a plan. Right. Yeah. I just would, if I would have it in front of you, if you could get that site, that Nevada case, okay. I'd like to see that because okay. I tried quickly looking it up, I couldn't find it. Um, I'm going to give you guys um, a copy of what I just read to you of my uh, presentation here. And I'm also going to give you a copy of the, the survey results. I didn't feel like that was something that, you know, I really felt like this was more important to talk about. <coughs> um, and all of this has my contact information on the bottom. So if you need any, any more information or if there's something else that I can help with, please contact me. Okay. And I, I, I take it the two of you have a good communication. So. <laughs> Anything else um, on this subject? We'd be glad to put those into the record. And uh, is, is this the? I'd like to ask a question. Is this the survey that was on the from the New Hampshire Normal website? <clears throat> Correct. It is the results from that particular survey. Um, so this wasn't. A random survey. This was through self-selected people that went through your website. I uh, no, actually, it was put out, and I'm glad you asked that because I wanted to mention that um, it was put out through multiple avenues. It was sent through a professional business network. Uh, before I got into developing the chapter for New Hampshire Normal, I owned and operated a, a professional graphic design agency for um, years, and we worked with a lot of local small business owners um, in the area, hundreds. So I have made uh, hundreds of contacts with different people asking them to fill it out and pass it along, not just specifically through a New Hampshire normal network. So um, I don't know what your standards are in considering these type of statistics, but um, you know, that's how it went. <laughs> you can, sh it just shows age, <coughs> profession, annual salary, if they're familiar with the law, and then questions about how they feel about different parts of the law. I went to that survey, and a lot of it was really directed towards 318B, not this. And that's beyond our scope, so. Mm -hmm. um, we're charged with 126X, not 318B. And, and to go with that, <coughs> I, I, scientific survey would be random calls mm -hmm. or some sort of that people can't self-select themselves right so I, I 
I guess the reason why I developed this is because um, I kind of wanted to put it out there that, you know, like you guys know, there's a lot of data to collect and there's going to be a process of creating um, this type of data collection. And it was just a, um, a, a suggestion to be able to think about that, get the momentum moving, moving so that you can have qualified and quantified data um, to move forward with these things and, and make them actual. So, you know, with that said, in response to your question, um, which is specifically the reason why I brought you this law case um, versus took 10 minutes and talked about the survey, is because the survey may have some things in it that you don't cover. Um, I did omit some survey results in here that I felt like you might not find interesting because it doesn't pertain <coughs> to you. However, I did list all of the questions that were put into the survey so that you could review those. And if you want more information or you want to see results from that or you want to talk to me about that, again, my information is at, is at, um, at the bottom of here. I think the obvious issue is the one that you brought up, which is very clear, and that is that gap between uh, the of the system so that it, it seems to me with legislation or some other way that we can speed up the opening up of the treatment centers uh, is a way of trying to deal with that. Uh, so I would hope that uh, because the legislation is in there, uh, that to have an opportunity to provide a variety of different solutions. Uh, is there the homegrown is still, I think, uh, a mm -hmm. difficulty. Doesn't have to be. <laughs> Could you maybe consider hiring a, a consult to be able to collect and quantify this data from reputable sources for you? so that you could utilize it without having to spend your time finding it? We'd, we'd love that if, if it was scientific. Uh, you know, but you, know, you have a point of view that uh, uh, is somewhat different from some of ours, not necessarily mine. But, uh, so it was a totally objective uh, scientific group doing research. But, uh, and I, I think people would love to see that. Because we haven't got any money to uh, spend on it. So that's something we can talk about. Okay. Any other thoughts? I, mean, I, I think the, the, the question is, is there some mechanism to bring that gap you know, as, as, as tight as possible and maybe close it? And there may be a variety of different ways of doing that. Uh, and that seems to be the major issue. And, and it's something that I heard, you know, during the testimony uh, on, the, on the legislation that did pass. Uh, and then it was a concern. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, the only thing that's left that I see is closing remarks. We may have had all of our closing remarks. But anybody else have any uh, thoughts? about how to proceed. The next meeting is in uh, February 28th, so that's quite a bit of time. Uh, some of us in the meantime maybe can begin to pursue some of the things we talked about uh, today. That gives the department quite a bit of time to move their project ahead. Uh, I'm hearing that, that the committee wants a bigger uh, involvement in the process in whatever way we can. That's school vacation week, just so you know. That's what? That's the Friday of school vacation week. Is it Friday? It's not really Friday, is it? Friday. It's a Friday, so it is the 28th? Okay, I didn't right. think we were out there. So, let's, let's take a look at that then. It stays, it stays, but you want the turnout. It might not be the best day to have it. Well, the, the issue of uh, Thursday's works uh, this time of year, um, uh, Thursdays become difficult during the regular legislative session because of um, other uh, you know, other Fridays. legislative matters. Um, I'm just saying that week. Yeah. Not we, Thursday and Friday. Friday. That, that week is vacation week. Week, 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 week. The week before that is gel car. Yeah. We pretty much never go beyond yeah. the uh, right, we, we can talk about that <coughs> some more. Okay, we'll, we'll take that into consideration. Sure. 
Anything else to come before us? Just a comment. Um, you know, I'm left with the idea of individuals here doing their own research and then uh, referring it. Just to give the department uh, maybe think about if there's particular areas that are more important than others to make assignments, I, I certainly would take one if you sure. wanted me to research geographic location or accessibility. Um, it'd be easier that way than just guessing or thinking what's most important and then you'd be, you're going to have a lot of data coming at from different angles. It might be easier to, to assign it, but it's up to you how you want to do that. I can, we can certainly consider that. Um, like I said before, you have, you're, on this, you're on this committee because you have certain expertise. Um, you know, regulatory standards for diversion would not be your issue. I would expect that to be an issue more uh, more appropriate for Chief Shigori right. or others. So to volunteer for that one would be odd. But um, so I think there's a natural kind of selection of issues that you might be able to help with. You know, some were non I, you know lack of a better word nonpartisan. So geography. I mean, I mean almost anyone could take it up, uh, consider that. Uh, but it's it's a, yeah it's something for us to consider. Um, but. Will I again? I can take that back, um, but feel free to. There's two months, so to feel free to some time to jump mm -hmm. jump on in there and pick a topic. And and if uh, if you got an idea and want to run it by me, you know, um, I can let you know if anyone else has volunteered for that issue. My guess is that that's not going to be the case, but um, I would urge you to come up with something on your own, and I'll take back the suggestion of assigning or issuing topics and having volunteers take them, perhaps. Because that, that is certainly, with, with four so-called treatment facilities for the whole state, that I, I have had calls, I get a lot of calls about um, people wanting to open up these. I actually had a call from a woman in the North Country that said she had 12 acres, she'd like to grow the marijuana for the whole state. <laughs> I think so that there is interest out there in a variety of uh, so I have a question. Ways. Is there a way that you could share amongst the members the, in, the information coming in, like you've had stuff submitted already, but do you share it with the group, or do you just want it to be yourself, or? Like, I wouldn't mind seeing other things that other people put into, like, Sure, I can, uh, I, can, I, can, I can easily do that. <laughs> so as we send it to you, you can just. One way to help alleviate some of the problems, trying to direct it all to Mike, is to, uh, you know, we ha all have access to each other. Yeah. So if we have kind of a group, like a group you know, group. post it on for the whole group to That'd see. Be great. Yeah. And then we all get to look at it, and, and that'll save the step of have, having to filter through Mike. Yeah. I, I appreciate that suggestion. We all have everyone's email addresses. Right. Yeah. If you want to create a group in your email system program, and when you send something to me, it's sent to the entire council. I mean, that solves the right. issue. And so whatever else has been submitted, you can, you can put <coughs> yes, out so I, we all have every, Everything that's been submitted, I will, Beautiful. I will recirculate to the, to the cool. committee, to the council. The only concern I can see with that would be 91A issues if we get into discussions of. That's true. We can't get into discussions of it. You can distribute stuff and it becomes part of the public record, but we could not discuss, hey, that's a good idea, that's not a good idea or enter into sequential discussions. Right. We now become a public body, so you can't, you have to be careful, cognizant of 91A restrictions too. Well, it's not that we can't distribute ways. information to everybody, but we can't discuss it and right. make decisions. That's, that's the right to know law. Uh, we, we cannot um, have a discussion among ourselves uh, I'm at a quorum of the committee uh, ever, unless it's open to the public. Uh, so no. the chief was right. Yeah, That's the danger when you start getting into some of these sequential emails and mm -hmm. and they have to be just I, I think by case law they have to be disclosed at our next meeting. But I think dissemination of information <coughs> without us taking any you know. I think you can disseminate it, but we can't discuss it and it has right. to be disclosed at the next meeting. Yeah. What can we send was could said. we send you a question that would to bring up on the agenda then? Would that be the appropriate yes, way to do it so that we would Sure. So when we would have a question on any of the information, we could submit it for uh, an agenda item or something. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, send it yeah. to me. Yeah, perfect. I think to your point, basically what we need is some kind of a bulletin board where you can't really respond, you can't react. 
react with each other to post things. I don't know. I, I don't know. I just know that's that's an issue that's gotten some bodies in trouble, yeah. public bodies. So we just post. Yeah. We don't respond. If we have a question we want on the agenda, we can we can get it on the agenda. You, you can distribute it, but you can't discuss it and you can't right. make decisions, and it has to be disclosed to people. But that has really has to be a quorum. Well, if it's distributed to all of us, if we right. all respond, right. respond all, <laughs> reply all, uh, with our comments. It, That's it the could. issue. It's one thing for four information, I think we're injecting our own thought process, if you will. It's a line we just have to be positive. Yeah. Yeah, as long as we don't take positions and don't vote. And, and, uh, but I think uh, there's a clear desire for, for the commission members to get more information that they can work on. Anything else? Motion we adjourn. A couple of questions for you. Go ahead. Um, I don't know when I see a public person on here, the chief of police, I'm assuming it's you, and, and I have no problem with that. I think that's fine, but I think there should be more of a public person. Uh, that's a good point because the legislation that's in there, the representative right to put in, adds a member representative of chiefs of police, and then the public member will be open to the public. I got about 25, 30 years of experience in in all of the laws in all the states, so I'd like to get on that. Okay. Um, but that's just on the side. But I'd if also you, want to if bring you do up want the, that, if that passes, you need to let the governor know that you want to do that because she has no way of knowing. Okay, I'll she, contact her tonight. Yeah. Her email. Right. I'll, I'll do that immediately. I also own a little bit of property in Michigan. I grew up in Michigan and stuff. Recently, I received a letter from my taxes and stuff, and they always put in their little what happens in the town, right? The last paragraph on the second page of it was specifically, if you own a medical marijuana card, we want you to understand that you cannot drive because we know you've smoked marijuana in the last 30 days automatically. <coughs> my concern with that really comes up with the police the chief being on here and you talking about you're trying to collect this data and stuff like that. It really, and, and Michigan had a big issue with that. People didn't sign up for the medical marijuana program because of that. Now Maine has went just the opposite. You don't have to get into no state regulations or anything like that. And until they did that, they had the same issue. They wouldn't get nobody to sign up on that. And, and legitimately, there ain't none of you here that would sign up for something that's going to take your license away, which means you can't come to work tomorrow. Okay? And, and blindsided, they can literally send you a letter in the mail that says, hey, we'd like to take that license, and either you send it to us, <coughs> or when we pull you over, we'll take it. You mentioned over here, uh, Stuart, about uh, a couple of different things here, medical and stuff. Medical marijuana has been one of the biggest research things for thousands of years. It has been researched. For the last 70 years, it's been prohibition. So the only research that could have been done in the last 70 years, and that was allowed by the government, was to justify why it was illegal. There was not once, never allowed to justify any value in it medically or anything else. This has just started to become something because of the medical thing happening now. Um, I, I could read on and go on about this stuff on a whole number of things. Your thing on the THC being a little higher and the CBDs and stuff, I'd say a couple of things. One of them, probably we weren't uh, even checking that kind of stuff 20, 30 years ago. Now it's a regular thing. You can get these tests everywhere. It's, it's something that now can be done more often. Secondly, if I could get something that's 20% THC instead of 2% THC, and I've got to smoke this product, okay? Now you're smoking cigarettes, and you're complaining about smoking cigarettes. If I can reduce my smoking down from one, or from 20 down to one, because it's that much more potent, that much more of a value for the medical and stuff like that. 
there's a gain right there, and, and it's a good one. It's probably very good for your lungs, okay? So there's, there's some real good things about this, but I really question whether there's that much of a higher in it than what there was 20, 30 years ago. It's that there's more <coughs> looking at it and stuff like that, and research into it. And they are going into looking at not just THC, but they're really focusing on CBDs and CBMs and stuff like that, and how we can increase them, because them are a lot of the pain relief comes from that kind of stuff. So they're focusing on how do we get a high THC for this particular patient. As she had just mentioned there, how do we get a higher CBD for somebody that really needs the pain relief in a different manner and stuff like that. That's all just now coming to light and stuff. So <laughs> there's a lot to it. Um, I, I, I would really like to get involved with that. I will talk to the governor immediately on that. And thank you for letting me see. Thank you. One more, very briefly. Um, speaking of the, the research he's discussing, there, there have been many questions about research. Myself, many of my colleagues have done all the research that's available. Any of you can contact us at any point. It's also not just the United States. Israel has been, for the last 20 years, compiling thousands of studies on medical marijuana because they've treated it appropriately, and therefore they do have the data. If you go onto the nursing databases, and look up all the different types of peer-reviewed studies, and I know you, <coughs> excuse me, what, what's your name? Me? No, sorry, man at the end. Andy? Uh, Andy Chagoy. Excellent. You talked about uh, concerns with the, the study put out by normal, that it wasn't peer-reviewed, it was self-selective. There are all kinds of very um, well-designed studies that are available overseas and here in the United States that we have, that we can present to you at any point. Um, they're there for the taking, and it's excellent quality information. Um, we so would like to, we'd very much like to see those uh, mm -hmm. be reviewed if you've got them. If we, we're gonna stop with uh, Sir, this one. I, the governor insulted me. I'm a combat veteran with PTSD. I was a combat medic in Vietnam. I served as a paramedic for eight years. I have PTSD bad. I'm 100% disabled. I have a dog. I wasn't insulted as I was disappointed because there are people that claim to have PTSD because they got arrested at Walmart and it was so traumatic. I got PTSD at 18 years old because I was a combat medic in Vietnam. My entire crew in mechanized infantry was killed. I have legitimate PTSD. And I'm not, dis I'm not, I'm not insulted by her. I'm disappointed that there's many, many combat veterans who are insulted by that. I got a file this thick, 20 years going back. I can't work. <coughs> This, this, this product is a miracle drug. This gentleman about the, I, I watched some of the, the, um, the best growers in Colorado been in the business, it's a family business, brother, and the, they said, I'm most proud of this plant. Why? Because it has 1% THC, not enough to get a puppy high, right? 1%, you go in dispensaries, it says 2%, 3%, it's like, do you want beer or do you want wine? And as far as side effects, Marijuana virtually has no side effects, and it, with the exception of people getting a little scared and then they come down. But it's, it's a legitimate thing, but, but people are, are, are pridefully growing pot with no THC or very little. You know, personally, I need the THC. It helps me, it calms me down. So I apologize for interrupting, but I've been waiting here for hours, and I just wanted to speak up for veterans who fought for this country, who died. I almost brought my t-shirt, I have 52 members, of my unit that were killed, including my entire crew. I came by PTSD legitimately. I didn't get arrested at Walmart. So if you can just pass that on to the government, I respond uh, to the governor, I would appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, 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 sir, I absolutely agree with you. I, I fought very hard. Uh, most of us believe that the PTSD, the serious PTSD should be covered, and I think it will be. Uh, but um, we, we, we did our best to get that in, but I was told that, that there was, um, the, the, the two things would not go back in or it would be vetoed, uh, which I thought was wrong. Uh, uh, and so that to me is, it was my background is mental health, and so therefore I understand your condition and I understand that we're gonna keep fighting until we get that back in there.
I, I don't know exactly what happened, but why, where that pressure came from. It, it, just one more thing, in, in New Mexico, 27% of all prescriptions are written for PTSD. By far the highest category is legal. It's mentioned specifically in six states. Thank you, sir, for your time. Last um, call. James, how, how can a member of the public uh, be able to kind of get some of these ideas and information in front of the government? <clears throat> Uh, the governor's office is probably <coughs> most available in terms of, of having staff who, who deal with um, 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 community um, individuals. I mean, all you have to do is call the governor's office and say, you know, I've got this information, I would like the governor to see it, or you can go through, um, the governor has a series of policy advisors. There's one specifically for health, and that's Amy Kennedy. She's a very bright woman uh, and very uh, knowledgeable, uh, and she would be a good one to uh, uh, send things through, and she's very responsive. And, uh, Thank you. I get the feeling it's getting cold outside, so... I have a distinct advantage over some of my colleagues. I live a mile from here. <laughs> so let, let's uh, officially adjourn. Please read the Monday front page of the Portland, Maine paper. It talks all about the CBD and the different things that need to be done.